Well, good morning, everybody. If it feels a little warmer in the building today, it has nothing to do with the thermostat. It has everything to do with the fact that Wally is back with us. <clears throat> I am so glad he's back. I'm getting tired of the first thing I hear on Sunday morning is, how's Wally? It's like, y'all forgotten I'm here, right? You can... No, that's not true at all. Uh, we're grateful. It's been like a month since Wally's been here. He's not been on a vacation in the Caribbean, though he would have liked to have been by comparison, but he's healing, he's doing better. I just have one favor to ask. If you have like any kind of sickness today, if you like think you might be sick in the next six weeks, don't go near him. I mean, please, he's recovering. And if you hug him, don't squeeze too hard. He might burst. Okay, so just be gentle with him, be considerate, but it is so good to have you back, my friend. I'm so glad you're back. So as Danielle said, we're going to wrap up our eight-week series that we've been in on the Sermon on the Mount, and I've enjoyed uh, the teaching that Darren has brought to this. I've enjoyed being a part of this series, uh, and it, it has been all about this central theme that runs through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where we find the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus teaches on how to have a makarios life. And we've talked about how that word, that Greek word that we translate as blessed really means much more than that. It's supremely blessed. It's fulfilling life. It's successful life. And it's not just found in the Sermon on the Mount. That thread runs all the way through Jesus' teaching in all four Gospels. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament, certainly my favorite verse uh, that Jesus said was in John 10.10 10, when he said, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. That is Makarios. And so this week, as I've looked back over this journey we've been on, I've looked at everything that we've studied and learned together, I realized just how simple and clear Jesus' teaching is and how profound it is. A Makarios life doesn't require us to do sensational spiritual acts. It's not like we have to become some kind of a spiritual superhero to have that kind of life. It's not our superpower. Instead, Jesus calls, him to follow, calls us to follow him down a simple, humble path to have a Makarios life. The message calls us to do things like embracing our spiritual poverty, which will in turn cause us to hunger for God's righteousness. It calls us to trust God for the simple necessities of life, food and shelter and warmth and love. Along the way, we've learned that a Makarios life will also deeply, profoundly change how we relate to people, all people. We live that kind of a life and we'll start to show mercy when our heart really is crying out for revenge or at the very least, justice. We learn to keep strong emotions in check like anger and our sexual impulses, especially when it comes to dealing with people of the opposite sex. We speak honest words when we have a Makarios life and we have the courage to stand behind those honest words. We learn to love our enemies we learn to love those unlikable, weird people that seem to be drawn to us for some reason. Jesus calls us to break the cycle of hatred and judgment that's so prevalent in our world if we want to live a Makarios life. That's a simple list, right? I mean, it's easy enough until we try to live all those things out on a daily basis. Just looking back through it, I recognize that there's at least one thing in that list that I need to work on. Connie says there's more, but I think it's just one. And I'm, my guess is there's at least one for you as well. And so the honest question that we come to at the end of the Sermon on the Mount is probably the same question that the people sitting on that hillside listening to Jesus teach 2,000 years ago had. So if this is a Makarios life, if this is what you're calling me to live, Jesus, and I weigh out my life and find out I'm here, how do I make progress? How do I grow? How do I even begin to take steps towards that rich and satisfying life that Jesus promises?
That's two songs this morning that I've had the same thought in my mind. If I could dance, I would, right? But I was born a conservative Christian, and like many of you, I had my hips fused at birth. I can't dance, so. Um, You know, I think as you look through the Sermon on the Mount, it's not so much the length of the sermon that was challenging for people. It's not that challenging for us, right? And you could take Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and just read them on a Sunday morning, and it would take about the same length, you know, as a normal message would here, about 25, 30 minutes, you'd be through it. So it's not the length, it's the depth of the content that's so challenging. There's a lot of profound truth in those three chapters. There's a lot of life change involved in doing exactly what Jesus says to live a Macarios life. I mean, we could just live our lives off of those three chapters, and I think that would pretty much be all we need to know about being a Christian. But I think when Jesus is watching the crowd, realizing the depth of the teaching, I think that's why he then, in the last few verses, gives a few summary illustrations just to kind of wrap up the talk and put a bow on it. And I've never really looked at the last part of Matthew 7 that way until I started studying for this morning. And I realized that Jesus there gives us four very striking images to help us grasp exactly what life is in him is demanding from us, this Makarios life. And so I want to just look at those briefly this morning, and I'm going to ask you three very pointed questions about where you are in that journey this morning. We're not going to embarrass you, not going to have you raise hands or anything like that. I just want you to think about them. Here's what Jesus says first, and it's, it starts off harsh. He says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life, this Makarios life, is very narrow. And the road you've got to travel down to get there, it's difficult. And there's very few that find it. You ever felt pressured by a group to do something? I mean, certainly when we're in, like, transitional years from being a child to being an adult, those middle school, high school, and and college years. We all felt that pressure, but it still hangs around even in our adult life. Good and bad peer pressure happens a lot. And depending on the situation, the pressure to conform can be intense. And so the path Jesus lays out says, you have to not go with the pack, not go with the herd, not just go with the crowd if you want to follow him. You have to choose the tougher path the more lonely path to follow Jesus. And not everybody is willing to make that choice. So Jesus says it really clearly here. The path to a Makarios life begins with a commitment to follow him. I heard about a young man just over the last few weeks, probably three or four weeks, I've been tracking his story, reading about him. His name is Colin O'Brady, and I think he is redefining what the word commitment means. Uh, I didn't know the backstory on his life, so I dug it up this week. Ten years ago, Colin was goofing around with some friends. They were on a holiday in Thailand, and they were daring each other to do, like, stupid stuff, dangerous stuff. And so uh, Colin took the challenge, and he started to jump rope with this heavy rope, right? That doesn't sound too challenging. Well, for some of you, it's pretty challenging, but he was just jumping rope. And then the dare just, they upped the ante. They soaked the rope in kerosene. And then they lit the rope on fire, and he proceeded to jump. And as any person over 40 in the room would say to them, you're going to get hurt, and he did. The rope got tangled in his feet. It caught his clothing on fire. And the net of it was that he received burns over 25% of his body, and nearly all the surface skin on his legs was burned with third-degree burns. The doctors took good care of him, but they told him over and over, Colin, you're never going to walk normally again. Doctors didn't agree with that. I'm sorry, Colin didn't agree with that. And so he committed himself to doing the rehab work with vigor. And he went on to fully recover. And as if to put an exclamation point on his recovery, he signed up for and competed in a triathlon and finished. Not just that one, but 50 triathlons over the next couple of years. 
he began to speak to elementary kids. He was invited to come and speak to them, and he talked to them about setting big goals, the kind of goals that people may look at you and say, that sounds impossible, that sounds crazy. Set those goals, go for them, commit to them. And in the process, he committed to something called the Explorer's Grand Slam. I'd never heard of this, have you? Explorer's Grand Slam involves hiking to the summit of the seven tallest mountains in the world. And they're each on a different continent. And not like that's not enough, but to complete the Grand Slam, you also have to ski into the North Pole and the South Pole. That's a lot. Well, that wasn't enough of a challenge or a commitment for Colin. The previous record was completing that all in 192 days. He set out to break the world record, and he shattered it, completing those nine quests in 139 days. It's ridiculous. I found out about him when I heard about his latest expedition he's on, which started November 3rd of this year. His goal, and this is this is Colin, his goal is to cross Antarctica solo and unaided. Now that means no food caches along the way. And people have studied this and said it's physically impossible to carry enough food with you, enough calories with you, to make that journey in the amount of time it's going to take. And so he said, that's great. All i got to do is shorten the time. So I'll make the trip in 70 days. A thousand miles. Pulling behind him 400 pounds of supplies on two sleds. He's 15 days in. And he's averaging just under two miles an hour, which is what he needs to do. And by the way, if you're curious, he is updating people on Twitter every day. (laughs) It's kind of crazy, isn't it, that you're like crossing Antarctica and you're still connected to the web? I read his story and I come to believe that human beings are capable of much more than we think we are. That we can accomplish some pretty incredible stuff once we make a commitment, once we're all in. I think that's what Jesus is getting at with this first illustration. Everybody wants the Macarius life when you describe it to them. The question is, who's willing to work for it? Are we willing to make the tough choices in life? Because Jesus himself said, following him is not always the easiest road. Sometimes it gets really hard. And we will never, ever drift into deeper levels of commitment to the way of Jesus. It doesn't just sort of happen to us as we're drifting along with the crowd. Yes, our spiritual path begins with the grace and the mercy and the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. But that doesn't mean it's easy. It takes a wholehearted commitment to follow Jesus every step of every day to the best of our ability. Years ago, I learned one of the great phrases of the 12-step movement, and it's that half-hearted measures availed us nothing. You can't break an addiction with half-hearted measures, half effort. And I am convinced we can't follow Jesus with half-hearted measures either. So here's the question for you this morning. How badly do you want the Macarius life that Jesus is offering? Is there a hunger in your soul? Is there a fire in your heart to pursue Jesus with the best of your ability? The second image that Jesus uses is from agriculture. And it's not hard, he says, Jesus says in this, to say, to tell the difference between a healthy tree. And an unhealthy tree, a good tree and a bad tree. So you can see the evidence in the fruit it produces. Good trees will produce good fruit and usually lots of it. Unhealthy trees, uh, if they do produce any fruit at all, it's probably not worth eating. And then Jesus applies this image to the Makarios life when he says, so just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you can identify people by their actions. That simple idea is all through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus makes it clear that his followers are to live a noticeably different life than everyone around them. We're held to a higher standard of conduct. 
We're held to the standard of love and selflessness that Jesus himself showed when he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And that means ultimately our commitment to the Makarios life comes down to a dozens and dozens of choices we make every single day. You can tell a lot by people's actions. In these three chapters, Matthew writes, Jesus addresses so many of the places that we get stuck in life, places we feel challenged in life, places we struggle in our commitment to follow Jesus. So how do we handle ourselves? What do we do when we're in a situation and our emotions start to escalate? That's a really good question given that we're in the holiday season and all the forced proximity with family we don't like is upon us. What are you going to do when emotions escalate? What are you going to do when family flare-ups happen? Will we let our anger lead us to bad choices, unhealthy words and actions? Are we the kind of people who seek revenge instead of offering forgiveness when we're wronged? Do we build relationships that are filled with trust and respect? Do we accept people and love them, or do we judge them? And what do we do inevitably, because it's going to happen, what do we do when a relationship breaks down? Jesus talks about all of this very simply, very practically in the Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus gets really personal when he starts digging into how we get tangled up and sideways when it comes to the stuff in this life, and he says really clearly You can't serve God and be enslaved to money. And I think that idea of being enslaved to money may look different to each one of us. You can be enslaved to money and have none. You can be enslaved to money and have a lot. It's a heart issue. Are you stingy or are you generous with what you have, with your money, your possessions, with your time? So many of Jesus' teachings are commands for us as his followers to do better, to rise above what society around us deems acceptable, what it allows, and what it expects out of human nature. So the question here is, what practical impact does the truth of Jesus have on your daily decisions, on your life? How is it fundamentally changing your work ethic? How is it changing all of your relationships in your neighborhood, in your family, on the job site, at church? How is it changing your attitudes and actions towards the world's greatest problems? Hunger, poverty, homelessness. In the same way you can tell a tree by its fruit, you can tell a lot about people just by watching their actions. The health of their soul is going to be painfully clear. The final two images Jesus gives teach us essentially the same idea. And he starts to address anyone who might listen to his words, be interested and curious about his words, think he's got some great turn of the phrase things in his talk, but doesn't decide to embrace it completely. Might not make or follow through on a commitment to the Makarios life. Jesus says, not everybody who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, a lot of people are going to say to me, Lord, we, we prophesied in your name and we taught lots of people about you. We, we, we even cast out demons in your name. We did great miracles in your name. And look at what Jesus says. He doesn't deny that they did those things. He says, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. He's painfully clear here. We can tack on a lot of good works onto our life and think God is going to be pleased with us. And the people in Jesus' example, in his, uh, in his uh, analogy here, did some pretty impressive things. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, taught lots and lots of people about God's ways. They actually exercised demons. That's some heavy lifting. They did miracles, healed people. 
some pretty serious stuff. But Jesus just looks at them and says, yeah, you did all that, but I didn't know you. You never walked with me. You never learned from me. You didn't take my principles and apply them to the life that you were living. And then, as if to just put an exclamation point on that, to remove all doubt, Jesus goes on to say, so anybody who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise. And follows it is wise. Kind of like a, a person who'd build a house on a solid rock. And though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. And when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it'll collapse with a mighty crash. Good words, grand gestures are not enough in the Macario's life. And in the end, they will not save us. The foundation of a Macarios life must be built on an obedience to Jesus. Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life, as best as we know, around his earthly father, Joseph. And you remember Joseph's profession, right? He was a carpenter. And in Jesus' day, That was really clear what that meant. He wasn't just like a skilled woodworker. He didn't make like cheese boards and wine stoppers to sell at the craft fairs in Nazareth. It wasn't what it meant to be a carpenter in Jesus' day. As a carpenter, Joseph built buildings, homes, buildings in the town. And he did everything as a carpenter from felling the tree to the finish work in those buildings. And Jesus worked alongside him for 15 to 20 years until he stepped out and began to do his teaching. So Jesus knew firsthand from practical lessons how risky it would be to build a house on shifting and eroding sand. In fact, in the region where Jesus grew up, carpenters would sometimes have to dig 10 feet down in the sand to get to bedrock to lay a foundation for the structure they were building. So this is a very personal illustration for Jesus, one that comes out of the context of his life. When he says, look, if you build on a solid foundation, you're going to be fine, no matter what life throws at you. And there's only one foundation, Jesus says, that'll hold up when the storms of life come. There's only one foundation that's not going to erode away when life is good and when we're all tempted to forget God. Jesus says, if you listen to my words and follow them, you're wise. In the final analysis, obedience is what really matters. A lot of people will hear good information when they listen to Jesus' teaching. They'll hear great platitudes, great thoughts, to inspire them. But only a few, Jesus says, will actually follow through and obey. So the question this morning, the last question, maybe the most important question I have for you is, what are you building your life on? Not in theory, but deep down, at the core of who you are. What guides your daily decisions? The hungers inside of you or the word of God burning inside of you? What's shaping your character? What's the bedrock conviction on which your values have been built? Wise people will allow Jesus' words to dig into the depth of their soul. We'll pray like the psalmist did, Search me, God, know my heart, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Know me. With the four images Jesus offers here, he emphasizes the same theme in different ways. Look, you can decide for me, or you can decide against me. You can decide to be with me, or live apart from me. You can decide to be my apprentice, or someone else's. 
But just like the people who heard that message 2,000 years ago, the same decision stands in front of us today. Will you listen to Jesus' teaching? Will you seriously consider his claims, his commands, his words that say he was the Son of God? And ultimately, will you decide not just to accept his grace and forgiveness in your life, but accept his leadership in your life on day by day by day basis? It really comes down to that. The Macarius life is waiting for any one of us who is brave enough to come out of the crowd. Brave enough to choose the tougher path. Brave enough to completely and as best we can follow Jesus.